This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, a community of more than 45,000 beer and brewing enthusiasts worldwide. The AHA publishes Zymergy Magazine, hosts the National Homebrew Competition and Homebrew Con, and equips members with brewing tips, proven recipes, and money-saving deals on beer, food, and brewing supplies. Founded in 1978, the AHA remains true to founder Charlie Papazian's timeless advice, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. Celebrate beer and homebrewing with the AHA at homebrewersassociation.org. Hey everybody, it's John Hall, the senior editor of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. I'm in our nation's capital. I think for the first time, no, I've done the show from here before. The beers are already kicking in. But I haven't done it from here and I haven't done it with this guy who's sitting across from me, Greg Engert. Of I guess officially it's neighborhood restaurant group, right? Yeah, that's the collection. Yeah, but nobody nobody knows that. Yeah, no. Everybody knows Blue Jacket. Everybody knows Birch and Barley. Everybody knows Church Key. Everybody knows Sovereign. And you are the beverage director, the owner, co-owner, the mm-hmm. the creative force behind the beers that we drink at what are arguably I. I and it's not much of an argument. Uh, some of the country's better new generation beer bars in the country right now. Thank you. Well, thanks for doing the show. My pleasure. All Great right. seeing you. So we're sitting here at Church Key. Uh, we're at a, a, a back booth. It's happy hour has sort of kicked in in the, in the district right here. And I have to say that I'm usually down here and hanging out at your bar during one of the, the savers or... Pandemonium. When, yeah, or when the Craft Brewers Conference comes in or like when there's all sorts of stuff. And you can't get a table. You can't get a chair. This Is, is this how it is? Like on just like a normal drinking night or no well <laughs> or am i freaking today? you out where it's Wait, like it's, just, it's, it's tuesday, tuesday night. Yeah, yeah yeah no i think what we see here is in dc people work a little bit later okay so like six thirty seven, it fills up okay uh but yeah so we open at four in, in a lot oh, of ways much just too so, late for my day drink. <laughs> exactly yeah. i know we actually can't open to four because uh, I mean, we could, but we don't because we're receiving so much beer and we're cleaning everything and putting everything back together. So there's so much work that goes on to prepare this place for each service uh, on the beer side that we don't open to four. But between four and seven is always a great time to kind of check this place out. It's much chiller uh, until we get to the weekends. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like compared to CBC when 15,000 people descend, <laughs> yeah, they fun. all come here. Uh, it, it's it's cool. I guess but it, it can get a little bit intense so it's a good time to be here now how many years has this been open now so that's what's crazy when you said uh kind of a the new generation i was flattered um by that for a number of reasons one of which is that in 2019 church key will be a decade old wow has it been that long it has and 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 it's it's a sore reminder for me because i was in my late 20s <laughs> when we opened and i will be so 40 I, yeah uh next fall right when we uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary of this in October of 2019. So that is crazy. Uh, yeah. All right. So I want to talk about the, the impact that this place has had in, in a few minutes. But all of the various beer bars that you have, and as well as Blue Jacket, the, the brewery, uh, as well here in the district. Um, it, it's a word that I, I, I think I've been using too much, but it, I, I haven't come up with a better word yet. So... What is your philosophy on beer service? Because I, 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 when I think of your places, uh, which, which I've been to multiple times and you know been forcibly removed from several, um, you know I, I, I think of the beer, but I also just think about the way that it's presented and the way right. that you know even right off the bat you're mentioning that you guys are cleaning your equipment daily, that you oh, guys yeah. are getting new shipments in all the time, yeah. which is not something that you get from like a neighborhood bar or you right. know so so so. So much of that flows through you. So what's the philosophy that you try to impart on the folks who work here and that you put out to your customers on a daily basis? Well, yeah, I think philosophy is, uh, is, is, a, is definitely the right term. It's definitely the right term today for it because it is a, uh, you know, a, a kind of list of, of edicts that we um, operate around and have for a decade here. But, you know, we've been doing craft beer in Neighborhood Restaurant Group for 15 years. And I've been 
uh, involved with it for longer. So uh, it's something that came about, for me, it really started about 15, just over 15 years ago. Um, and the idea was to, to match the, the, the passion, but the, the attention to detail, uh, the effort, the care, the consideration of sommeliers, and even mixologists back then that were just starting to really pick, uh, the mixologists trying to pick up steam, but mostly to match all of the efforts of the brewers um, in our service. To say that before so much, so much time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears, artistry was poured into crafting the beer, um, and then if you could even find it, it would typically just be served like any other industrial beer going back to the mid 90s late 90s early 2000s and so when I encountered that in the early 2000s I I, I said you know this is just these beers deserve something more and I was coming at it from a wine angle and just said we need to 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 match uh, the service of the sommeliers and and to you know basically say if you're going to spend all this time making these beers in those days on the west coast because that's where a lot of our great craft beers were coming from in the early 2000s out here, it was no good to not give it the same kind of uh, love and care that it was getting in its creation once it got here. So many times it would get here, it would be left warm someplace, it would be old. I mean, drinking bombers of stone ruination in the early 2000s that were six months <laughs> yeah, old those, yeah. was like, people were like okay with it because it couldn't get it elsewhere. But I was just saying like, what if it tasted like it did out there what if and that was always my goal was to say if brewers could come to church key or rustico alexandria our first beer place in virginia which is still going strong and tell me which they have our beers taste the way they do at our breweries at your spots then we've done it and then i said what if we can make them actually taste even better and that's when we started to (laughs) (laughs) uh to to institute things like temp controls i mean where we are right now in church key we designed the first uh, temperature control draft system in the U.S. That is something that I don't think a lot of people realize. Ten years ago, you would drink all beers coming out at 35 to 37 degrees. And unfortunately, to your, to your question about philosophy, today in 2018, that's still the case. It's crazy to me that that's the case. I mean, and most, even the best beer bars in the world are serving their beers too cold across the board. Their pilsners are too cold at 35 degrees. You know? yeah. So we changed all that here, and we've done it in our other spots. And I think a lot of people appreciate it, although I think we can do, be doing more. And your temp-controlled system, because I wanted to talk about that, uh, is not a flux capacitor, right? This no, is Gabe no, Gordon's... No, uh, no. Yeah. But, but this is... But that came later. It, we actually don't... I'm happy to tell you why we wouldn't use that, but um, yeah, sure, we, no, yeah. Why not? Because, I mean, that's the one that yeah. gets a lot of the attention. It's cool, um, yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's a cool, a cool thing. looking thing. Yeah, and yeah. It's, you Great know, name. And, yeah. Uh, and does a lot of stuff. I, so, let me see. The, the, big, the first thing is that um, we need to temperature control the beers. That, that, is, that is what we want to do, and we know that. And, of course, you're going to be dealing with different CO2 breakouts at that uh, when you start to change temps, whether you're holding them at those temps or serving them. But when we started here, uh, we were holding everything at the temp it would, serve, it would be served at. So 42-degree cooler glycol that's keeping it at 42 until it gets to the tap, serve at 42. Yeah. Same thing for 48, same thing for 54. And we developed in 2012 uh, a way to hold everything at 37, which is better. You won't get that gas breakout, uh, but then zap it through he- reverse heat exchangers on the way so that it would turn into that tap when it gets there. And that's what we've done at like Sovereign, Blue Jacket, Owens Ordinary, our place up in uh, Bethesda in Maryland. Um, so we're really, we're really careful. And By the way, I love the marketing that you're doing. Like you've now worked in, I think, all of the places save for one now at this point in the group, right? Isn't there a burger joint that uh, that you haven't? Oh, there. Are, well, there's there's actually about a dozen more <laughs> in the group, but but no. Right, but so we got forty five minutes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so you can drop that. Stay in, tuned. In, in, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I love the market. You're just yeah, like no, dropping uh, casually, just it's like very right casual, in the conversation casual. there. Yeah. But uh, but no, I'd say so. Keeping the the temps uh, is the first most important thing, and then obviously we don't want breakout. The gas blend idea that Dave's using on the flux capacitor is really cool, and it makes a lot of sense. It's super geeky, which I love, and it is for sure true that te- kegs with different PSI, different pressures, yeah. need to be served at different with different gas blends depending at the temp you're trying to serve them. That's for sure. However, it's really tough. It would be tough here. If every time we tapped a keg to go up onto our mezzanine, 
tap the keg, adjust the gas blend we think is right, then somebody's sitting up there and then adjusting the, the, the PSIs on the keg itself while you're trying to pour, you'd spend a good deal of the keg just trying to get it right. Yeah. What we've found is there is um, a gas blend that works for at, at these temps across the board, uh, a PSI that works for each of the temps, and then... Uh, we use flow control faucets, yeah, which kind of solve everything. So I think the flux capacitor looks super cool, and it definitely does a lot of great work. Um, but I've, def- I've noticed, I've seen it in a lot more places in New York City, for instance, recently, and I don't think a lot of them are actually using it. It just seems like it's it's a nice there. It's a nice yeah. showpiece. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I guess yeah. it, that brings me to the other part of it, is a decade in here, and I, I remember being here, gosh, right after you guys opened. I was in town for... For something unrelated at the time. When you were writing a book at the time. I was. And you were downstairs at Birch and Barley. I think you sat at the bar. Yeah. Uh, I think that was one of the nights I was forcibly removed. (laughs) Um, Just joking, maybe. Um, You know, but from back then to now, um, I haven't seen a wavering in that commitment. And, and, And this isn't blowing smoke because... What I find in traveling around quite a bit, and I'm, I'm sure the folks who are listening, um, you know, when, when you travel around, um, there's places that have a great list, but don't always have the commitment to the full service, like like the, totally. the experience from beginning to end. And because I think that it's really hard, and running yes. a bar or running a restaurant and running certainly both is very hard to begin to with. begin with. Right. And when even you if you're serving on, Budweiser and wings, right, it's hard. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you start to add on all of these extra layers, I, I think it's that insane. at some point, like <laughs> you can just be like, ah, you know, yeah, I, mean, it, I can, can just have this as a showpiece. I can just go from there. Where do you guys have those reconcile with yourselves moments where it's like, God, it's another Tuesday, and I gotta, you know, I gotta do this. Like, you know, should I? Like, is it like what keeps the the motivation right going? Is well, it yeah. You know, is it reputation? Is it ego? Is it just, you know, like the day that like it no longer matters? Is that the day that you, you know, you pass it on to somebody else? I think it's else? all those is things. That, I think yeah. it's all those things. I think it's, you know, but you, <laughs> first I want to address the fact that you're absolutely right. I mean, when we started out, when I started out in this, um, even before Neighborhood Restaurant Group, I saw an opportunity to do something new and something that I thought needed to be done. You know, I mean, I was at the Brick Skeller, which is America's first beer bar, yeah. rest in peace, no longer around. But in 1957, this place opened up with over 20 different beers and bottles and cans. Which was, this is crazy. Yeah. When you think and, about the year was and the they amount. Corona yeah. then, and that is something to be celebrated because in 1957, <laughs> Corona was cool. That was awesome to get back then, but like, they had, so they had that going for them. Wait a minute, it's not cool now? Uh, it depends on who you okay. are, I guess. I, I, I guess, I don't know, no, it's, <laughs> It's a horrible beer. No one should drink it. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right. We'll that's, come back to that. I mean, that's for sure. That. So okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the Brick Seller, like, uh, you know, they were doing it and, 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 and just serving all these great, amazing beers. And at that time, procurement was necessary when, more than anything else. In the 70s, the 80s, and into the 90s, just being able to get something that wasn't industrial swill was important. So procurement and, and, just, and, and just showcasing it was enough. Uh, and that continued for a long time. But when I came to it, I was lucky. I was at the Brick Skeller. We had 2,000 bottles and cans of beer. We had a number of drafts upstairs, but not that many. And luckily, a lot of the beer was bottle conditioned. Be- beers that are built to last. Belgian stuff that, and, and English stuff that had could last for a couple of years. Um, but, you know, so I looked at that and said, wait a minute. What if we just... What if we turned all of our attention and passion to this and made it taste even better? And what if we matched the passion of the book we said before, right? So I saw that and went after it, and it made a ton of sense to me. It elevated the product without making it pretentious. We started to look at beer and food pairing. And at that point, 2004, I thought that's where the industry was going. Okay. And it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't. What has happened instead is a preponderance of beer and not a preponderance of service. And so, to your point, in 2009, when we opened Church Key in Merchant Barley as a temple to beer service and care uh, with temp controls, with perfectly clean glassware, I mean, using high temp dish machines that do not employ chlorinated cleaners, uh, things like that, I was like, this is the way it's got to be, this is the way it's got to be. But it became at that time so popular and so much good beer out there that it became more important just to have certain things than, to, than the way that you serve certain things. And that, I think, is, is unfortunate. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, 
Megan Krigbaum. I don't know. Do you know her? She she's a, a wonderful writer. Um, yeah. She worked at Food and Wine for a number of years. Now she's with, she's a Punch. Yeah. She's remember, up in New York. Yeah. In New York, right? She is a friend of mine, and she contacted me about a glassware story she was writing. I'm not going to name names here, but she. I, I was immediately like, "Oh my God, yeah!" And I gave her this whole my whole spiel on glassware and how important I think it truly is. And she had asked a couple of other uh, publicans, uh, new Republicans, uh, about their ideas of glassware, and they were like, "Glassware really doesn't matter to us." And there you have it. I mean, these are and these are places that have dynamite beer lists that people may line up for and would be celebrated online. But glassware is not that important to them now. So I always say that you know, serving craft beer does not a craft beer bar make because it's not that hard to get a lot of great beers that people are going to line up for. The cool stuff, the hazy stuff, the pastry styles, and the, and the fruited sours. What is hard is tending to five different cask engines yeah. every day, replacing the lines every two weeks, which we do, dumping cask beer because it didn't move fast enough, even though it just cost hundreds of dollars to get it here from Scotland or England or wherever it else is. Like, that's hard. That's expensive. And what drives me is, like, when you get a perfect pint stateside, it reminds me of being in a pub in London, it makes me want to go back. It brings back great, you know, ideas, and I feel like we're keeping some traditions alive. Well, all right. So you just hit on about nine things that I want to uh, now, you know, follow through with. So yeah. we are drinking Cascal right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what is this? So this is from. This is called Maverick. Uh, it is a uh, a bitter uh, from Fine Ales, which is one of my favorite uh, breweries in the world right now. It's a brewery that's been around for about 20 years. I'm oh, sorry, they just celebrated their 17th birthday like a week ago. Yeah, with a Y, right? Yep, F-Y-N-E. Yeah. Ales. They're from um, Scotland. They're from just northwest of Glasgow uh, on the coast near Campbelltown, right near Oban Distillery mm-hmm. to put that in. 100-year-old farm. This is Jamie DeLapp is the, is the you know, managing owner now, but his mom and dad started it. Uh, it's a farm that's been around for 100 years. They changed it over 20 years ago, and they're, they're, what they're doing is something that I love. More Beer does it too, uh, where they take classic British-style beers, but also beer-making methods, single infusion, um, real ale, stuff like that, and then they uh, Americanize a little bit. They'll use some different uh, kinds of hops. So I think this has Centennial and Bramling Cross, so it's yeah. very British, but it's also very American. Yeah, and... and- so here's the thing, and, and I think that a lot of folks who are listening right now might have the similar experience. When I travel around to beer bars and I see a beer engine on the bar, you know, near the bar, whatever, um, I immediately discount it. It's going to recoil in horror. <laughs> right. So it, because I, it, it's almost never done well uh, here hard, in the yeah. U.S. You know, there, there's never proper cellaring that happens. You know, there's people who, you know, treat cask in the same way that they would a keg and... and no, you, you, you obviously can't do that. But right before we started recording, you sat down and you put these two pints down in front of us. And just looking at the beer, I knew that it was from Cask. And I didn't have any worry, which which, right. which is kind of cool. And I, I guess the biggest thing, though, is can you justify, even in the long term or 10 years in, uh, but for another 10 years, of dumping hundred dollars worth of beer, hundreds of dollars worth of beer, um, you know, what's essentially profit uh, because it didn't move fast enough. And is it, is, is it twofold? Like, is it one, like, okay, like, sure, that's just the way that it's going to be. Or two, where does education come in mm-hmm. to try to convince more people to drink cask, especially in this market right yeah. now where. Yeah. No, they don't even want to drink out of a glass right now. They, they, it's cans. Okay. So, you know what I mean? So, I, yo, you're right. Yeah. What, where do you stop? Uh, I don't know. I can't stop. It's, so I can't stop. <laughs> I love this. I, I came but from at one a different point, like, time. The, I mean, know, do the accountants come down and just be like, knock this the fuck off? That's where the ownership part is good. Yeah. Uh, you mean, like, I, I happen to be one of the owners here. That's helpful. Yeah. Because, yes, if I was just some guy who came in off the street today and was like, I've got a great idea, it probably wouldn't fly. And, frankly, we could be making more money if we didn't do a lot of these things. I mean, do you know what draft cleaner, like, caustic and, and then also acid we use throughout the year to clean these lines? It's insane. And, like, and, you know, but... It's just, it is, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this or not? And I think it always will justify itself until it doesn't. Because frankly, I, church, I don't want to have, I don't want to be in church key. I don't want to drink in a church key that's not dispensing Cascade all this quality. It's just not church key anymore. It, it'd just be another one of these places that's serving 
three kinds of beer uh, that I just mentioned yeah. before. And 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 oh, by the way, I love those beers. I love pastry stouts. I love hazy IPAs, and I love fruited sours. I just love them alongside unfiltered lagers, real ales, uh, bone dry Belgian triples. You know things like that. So it's just it is what it is. It's the path we've chosen. It, we may go out of style. It would be unfortunate. We may close, but that's what happens. You know what I mean? Some people survive if they stick to it. And, and I think education, we're all in. But frankly, at the end of the day, we move through probably six to eight casks. Uh, I'd say about, about six, yeah, six to eight casks a week here, which is good. And we, we yeah. do service. We, we use breathers, but we don't, we don't tap in breathers until we get about two days into uh, the cask. So we're doing sauce piles, and then we're switching over to a breather to get a little bit more time. Uh, you know, we're letting the cast settle for so. You know, I think it's just it you're, is what you're it treating is. it well. You're not just it's absolutely American yeah. manhandling at it. At, oh yeah, yeah, it yeah, 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 yeah. And that's how we get a little bit more time out of it because you can't go through a cast any quicker, in my experience, and have variety. But the product mix is big, right? I mean, people drink draft beer, and thankfully, draft beer is king. So even if we're dumping some casks, or even if we're not moving as many bottles and cans anymore, our cost percentages are still good enough because of the way that the mix is. Perfect. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Thanks, man. Wow. Beer 2 just hit the table. And another cask. Yeah, yeah this yeah. one's from Ridgeway, so not in Scotland. This one is uh, in England. It's uh, Peter Scully, who was at Braxbeer before yeah. he got to Ridgeway. And Braxbeer Bitter was uh, one of the greatest bitters ever. When I actually started in the early 2000s at Brickskeller, uh, the brewery had closed, but they still had some bottles left over, so I was able to taste it. But Peter does Ridgeway. He brews Coniston for the U.S. market. Uh, he does the series of kind of famous, infamous holiday beers every year. This is Lump of Coal, his Holy export crap. style. And uh, on cast. That is aggressive. For an English beer, it's like burly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, wow. All right. I'm getting a lot off of that. And I probably shouldn't. Yeah, I forgot. It's maybe a little strong for. No, it's the, fine. Yeah, it's about eight percent. We don't have anything to do tonight. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so the. Uh, all right, I want to change gears a little bit because w- what I found interesting, when you're talking about the early days of Bricks Keller, um, they had to go out and procure the beer. They had to be the proactive ones to go out and say, "Hey, you know, brewers from around the world. Hey, small brewers from around the country." Uh, we want your stuff. Right. These days, if you're a beer bar and you're a beer bar like this, I can't imagine the emails that you must get, especially being here in the district where dis- distribution goes. laws are. Yeah. To wax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and that's just sort of the nature of the nation's capital, which I think is kind of cool. Is that you know pretty much anybody can can come here, and everybody wants to come here, and since everybody is from someplace else for the most part. Uh, they want their hometown beer, their home country beer, or something like that. So with 7,000 breweries in the country, um, and you can pretty much have access to all of those if you wanted, plus the international, it's not so much about procurement as much as it is you're the gatekeeper. Discernment, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. discernment, yeah. yeah. Um, how, how do you even begin to approach something like that? Yeah, it's crazy and difficult. You're right. I mean, uh, we do get a lot of emails. Um <laughs> And uh, taste a lot of cool beers. I mean, some really cool breweries have started with an email. It's like, hey, I want to send you some beer. And I'm like, sure, I'll take some beer. And they send it. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing. We'll go on. But I think there are 7,000 breweries. And yes, you can bring anything you want into the district without using a distributor. However, many breweries are very small. And they don't need to send any beer beyond their tap room anymore. So right. we are lucky to have a reputation that will draw some out of their, uh, out of their tap rooms more than others. But... It's a little bit tough. And then if you can, the thing I will say, just to disabuse some people of the uh, notions of, of what it means to sell beer in D.C., John's right. It's the only jurisdiction in the U.S. where you do not have to use a distributor. Most do. Right. You don't have to. But the reason why, and I, I've talked to so many beer bar owners that are like, man, I wish I lived in D.C. If I had a bar in D.C., I'd you know, do what you do. And it's like, well... Maybe. The problem is is that if you don't bring in enough beer, the freight cost is more than you're going to pay on, sh- on distribution. Interesting. And, yeah. and you have to find a place for it. So we're lucky to have a number of places in D.C. that I can spread the beer around 
to each place as it comes in, and, and that is helpful. But uh, you know, I think it's word of mouth, it's friendship, it's tasting, it's traveling. You know, if Sean Hill tells me that there's a cool brewery that I haven't heard of in Germany, I'm gonna try to get my hands on it immediately, sure. you know, to taste it and bring it in. The Shelton Brothers from Belchertown, Massachusetts, Dan Shelton <laughs> and that group, I mean, they are an incredible You just drop these in team. effortlessly. It's just... But, like, I mean, I have... The, the, yeah. These two beers we just had on yeah, task are both from Shelton Brothers. Yeah. Like, these guys make... And they, they find and they and do procure, the legwork. Yeah, yeah, and they get beautiful So a beers. lot of it is trust on some level with the relationships that you have. Yeah, but also... Yeah, absolutely. And then I've also been lucky enough to travel with these guys. So, like... I'll go to Franconia and taste, uh, you know, Franconian lagers from some of the most incredible little breweries in the world, uh, including uh, Zehendner, which makes Monksenbacher. If you haven't had that, you need to go there and drink it. It's unbelievable. Um, you know, and, and so then you learn more that way. And, and it's all about, you know, tasting. And, and you kind of, you know, at this point, you learn, I'm almost 40, right? You know what you like. And... Uh, I'm always about, though, to, to the point about how many breweries there are. I like to find breweries I love because the best breweries make everything incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Hill Farmstead, uh, Suarez, Family Brewers, uh, De La Seine, yeah. uh, Mars, Mars Boy from, from Bamberg, you know, th- and across the Fine Ales, Ridgeway. I like to find those breweries, commit to them, and bring in as much as possible and support. Uh, and, and, and that's what your customers yeah. come to expect yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like they're going to come in and they're going to be like, all right, if, if it's on and that but that's got to be, I guess, the tough thing as well. And I wonder if that makes you a little gun shy, because if, if somebody comes in and they know that you have that reputation and it's OK, like no matter what, this is going to be a great point. Like that's sort of the expectation that you have here. Yeah. Um, that's really tough because, you know, you might take a chance on somebody, um, but you can't necessarily take like the leap of faith no never uh, no 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 and even when that's when this stuff comes in we're tasting it i'll give you a great example yeah um kotska uh from you know kotna Samavia, it's an, one of the best czech brewers in, tight, yeah. in the world uh they're from west of of just west of pilsen on the border with germany they make incredible uh unfiltered and unpasteurized lagers we strive to serve kotska 10 and 12 year round uh on draft so the 10 and 12 degree, they're both pale lagers from, from, uh, from the Czech Republic. Bitter, dry, hot forward, amazing. They're unfiltered and unpasteurized. We buy them in bulk. We store them really well. Every now and then, one of the kegs won't taste right. It's not anything they did wrong. Frankly, it's probably something we did wrong with storage. Uh, or not maybe getting the beer on draft, whatever it is. And like we said, like with the cask, we taste it, we dump it. But we go to huge lengths to protect those beers and make sure that we're not serving something that wouldn't be proper. Yeah. And it's all in the service of what you said. For somebody to come in and go, I trust you. I've never heard of all these Kazoon Height beers like you said, but I want to try them and I'm willing to spend good money, hard-earned money on it because I trust you. Yeah. I mean, when I came in and I was setting up the equipment and you weren't here yet, uh, one of your servers came by and I, I just said... I would like a delicious lager, please. And didn't even look at the menu, and whatever I got was was delicious and a lager and exactly what I was looking for because it's that leap of faith. And I feel like that in lesser places, you know, I wouldn't do that. Um, you touched on some of these small breweries, uh, and there's so many that are out there these days, having their tap room and that the beer doesn't leave the tap room. And in recent weeks and in recent years, I guess more, more, more so, we've seen some of the original beer bars in the country uh you know the great places you know your 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 map room uh your hop leaf uh uh falling rock um you know sort of rail against the tap room model and the brewery model um or even in some cases where breweries are now opening up their own tap rooms that are not brewery yeah. that don't have an actual brewery in it but like just serve you know all all of their beer where's is there a line for you on a brewery that is eating into your market where it's like, okay, like you guys are, you know, too big or you guys are going to cut into, you know, our bottom line, you know, to keep our lights on and our employees paid and, you know, all of that. Or, you know, is, are we headed towards some sort of great reckoning as well between right, yeah, beer yeah. bars Stand and breweries off. as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a phenomenal question and one that we could frankly talk for hours about and, and honestly I would say that we should we should think about 
trying to get Michael Roper, uh, you know, Chris Black, myself, Tom Peters, and, and but also a lot of the, some of the younger, uh, newer publicans on a on a panel at some point to talk about this. I think it seriously would be great. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I have to say that first off, I love um, all those guys I just mentioned. I, I love Hop Leaf. I love Monk's Cafe. I love Falling Rock. I, uh, yeah, I love the Bricks Keller. I, I love everything they've done. I think that they've been uh, super loyal to a lot of brewers as they've grown. I think I have been too. But I looked at Chris Black when he wrote that, uh, I guess, like, treatise. A yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I, I went and, and he made a cool point about, I mean, some of the classic beers that he's still serving. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale for 20 years. He's got a special tap handle. Uh, you know, New Belgium Ranger, I think it is, or you know, Fat Tire. But, like, anyways, like, he's, they've been incredibly loyal. I can understand how they feel burned, especially because they were doing it before I was. I mean, you know, um, I am, I, I have to say, we own a lot of different restaurants and bars. We do a lot of different things. We have beer at all of them, but some of them aren't beer centric. So I take a little bit of a wider view. The restaurant business is super hard. I think that, you know, there's over the last 10 years nationwide, there's been like a 22% increase in restaurant openings. In D.C. in that same time period, it's been 67%. It's huh. insane. Yeah. Labor's impossible to keep. Uh, it's just, it's a, nuts, it's a nuts world. So I guess I'm just kind of a little bit more fatalistic about it. I think that the world goes where it goes. We have to be responsive. I'd love to never change some of these things that we're doing, but I just am kind of like things change. And I... I don't love the fact that these guys are, are experiencing hardship because some of these brewers are competing with them. But, you know, I mean, I think Michael's Roper's talked about, you know, we've had to sell more wine and cocktails. We have, too. And it's have you have you seen a, an uptick in that? Yeah. Well, we kind of, you know, to be honest, we opened in 2009. We started with it. Yeah. Uh, and we just always wanted to have a more well-rounded like experience because you got to hedge your bets. Uh, you know, when you first got it, we started this. You know, it was a little bit less busy than it clearly is right now. Sure. Well, 10 years ago, it was busy right from the start. So, like, I just, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just and resigned. Do, I mean, to that. But do you know if people are going to the new place down the street or are they going to a tap room instead or are they going to, like, do, do, do I you? I think in DC, I can tell you, they're going to someplace new. I think, and in a lot of places, everybody, it's a, it's a, it's a lot more um, exper- experimental instead of experiential. The idea of the neighborhood bar and restaurant. Is, is dying and has been dying for years. I mean, we list things out. We want to try the new. I do it, so yeah, I'm not I casting yeah. aspersions. I, I think it's phenomenal. When I go to a new city, what I try to do, it's kind of what I try to do my beer list, right? If I go to Colorado, I'm, I'm going to go to Good Zur because i got to see this place that's devoted exclusively to sour beer and try to figure out how they make that work. <laughs> um, but they do, and it's amazing, and I love it. And the, the incredible it's food menu, spot, yeah. Uh, yeah, I might add. Like, incredible cheese. I don't know how they handle cheese so well there. It's amazing. But, but then I'm also paying my respects, and not just paying my respects, enjoying the hell out of going to Falling Rock. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... So th- I'm doing that, but a lot of people are just like, you know, what's new? But then at new? some point, though, during your time in Denver, somebody's going to say, hey, we're going to go check out this new spot, or we're going to a tap room, or we're going to... And of course, you're going to go along with it as well. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah, just totally. sort of so the, the way tap room that we thing. are. Let's talk about days. that. Yeah. Because yeah. I've kind of skirted that. So tap rooms are tap rooms. I think people go to tap rooms. I love tap rooms. They're super fun. Um, they're... What I think they do is provide something new to do, right? Like, so there's like, you can go to a baseball game, you can go to a bar, you can go to a restaurant, or you can go to a tap room. I think it's kind of a separate thing in some respects. Um, I get it that it's taking some people away from the beer bar, as it were, but I think beer bars pulled people out of the neighborhood bar or pulled people out of the, the wine bar. You know what I mean? So I think we're all, listen, we're all fighting for tooth and nail for for guests and i think that i know that this place has changed uh, in many ways even though we're still committed to our base philosophies and tenets we've changed a lot and it's just it's the nature of the game now i don't know where i stand on the idea of everybody kind of dividing up the beer market uh because i think that that's where this comes down to right? right it's like you get to make it but i'd prefer that you sold it through us 
I'm I'm very very like understanding and in, in agreement on a lot of those issues. But I think to think that that the system the way it's been for so long is going to remain like that. It's, it's just I just don't think it's, it's it's possible. I mean I think it's gone past the point of return. I don't know what some of these others think is going to change at this point that's going to deter, deter taproom sales for instance it's trying to stop the tide from rolling in in some ways it's it's already it's already up to our gone. ankles and beyond yeah, yeah. yeah so what do you think i mean do you find do you, i'd like to know what you think about it i like both you know i like coming to bars like this where i can get a wide variety and you know in the in the city in new york it, it it's no secret to anybody i drink at blind tiger regularly because you know i trust their their owners, their their managers, yeah, you know, the folks like, where I can just walk in and just blindly order. Um, but I also really like going to tap rooms because it's different than going to a local beer bar. Uh, totally. Tap rooms are indicative of a neighborhood, and you can get a sense of a neighborhood uh, better than I, I, I think that you know. Even sitting here right now, I don't necessarily know like what's happening around right. you know the walls around me or outside in the in the general world here. But in, in tap rooms, you know, it's it's a personification of brewers' philosophies, owners' philosophies. Uh, you know, it's not trying to be a one size fits all or hey, we have some cool mood lighting or you know like you know whatever. It, it, it's yeah, their, stripped down for sure. Though. Right, it's it's their place day in and day out and it's it's what they want to represent yeah. and so i think that that gives me a better appreciation of the beer um whereas here you know it's about you know the beer itself and not necessarily you know about what's on the walls or anything else as right. long as like it looks nice and doesn't and doesn't right, right, right. and i do think that there's room for both, both me too you know I, I i do but i also i guess I, they're I, arguing I that there isn't because people yeah. are choosing the latter than the former of what you just described yeah and, and, and we're I working say, to get chris black on this uh, on this show yeah. uh, down the line and i and i'd love to hear you know from him and and to to so yeah chris did chris black uh the co-founder of falling rock in denver on his blog and if you go to the falling rock website you can actually read uh this you know long screed that he put out about what he sees as the current state of uh, being a publican and being a bar owner um, and, and being in beer service in 2018 is all about. And, and I encourage folks to go read it uh, and then really consider what he has to say and see how it impacts your life uh, as a drinker, as a listener, um, and, and see if it actually moves you one way or the other. And, and that sort of brings me, as, as we start to wrap up here, you know, to, to the last point of where do the consumers come in as to where service goes in the future. And because, I think because yeah. we're in this untapped era and we're in this Yelp era and we're in this, you know, the customer is always right kind of thing, uh -huh. but like not always because it's a dance. It's a dance. It's always every every commercial and artistic and commercial endeavor is a dance, right? You're trying to balance the needs of the creator, the the artist, the publican, the restaurateur, uh, whoever it is with the desires of the guests. To think that anyone is able to just, just, just produce whatever they'd like uh, in a vacuum and expect people to just lap it up for days is, is ridiculous. And no, no, no artist, no business person, nobody has ever done that. So it's always a dance. We win, on the, I think, on the, the public side when we get to keep doing what we want to do with... Um, a modicum of, uh, you know, adjustments for the guests, right? I mean, but at the same time, it's adjustments. For instance, I bet you, and I know for a fact, there are a lot of people that come into Church Key and hate the fact that we have televisions on the wall. It's like... I'm not a fan. Right, exactly. I'm personally not a fan. Yeah, and there's so lots right of people now, who are like yeah, that. Yeah, there's ESPN is playing, there's an Ant-Man movie playing, um, you know, and I like both of these things in other contexts, but right. just, yeah. So that is... In a perfect world, I think a lot of publicans would agree that, that no, there should not be televisions in bars. However, it's not just our perfect world. We have to begin. So that, I'd like to say that is a bigger, um, a bigger point here about change, evolution, and where we go. The one thing I'll say and what I would say about the whole idea of you know, massive beer bars came about based on very specific circumstances in time, very specific pressures of the market, of production, of, of brewing, uh, things like that. Like the, the Falling Rock, Church Key, Monk's Cafe, don't come out of nowhere. They come from certain uh, pressures and stresses and time periods, right? 
Same with these tap rooms. But all I know is that, same with Hazy IPA. And what I can tell you right now is that in five years, Hazy IPA is not going to be what Hazy IPA is today. I promise you that. It's already not what it was six months ago. Yeah. And so all we can be sure, uh, sure of is change. So for anybody to think that we can just freeze something in time and know that's going to happen, it's not going to happen. Right now, lagers. This is a great bellwether thing. All right. uh, be United is uh, another great importer. has been bringing in beers based From off of... Yeah. yeah based on, and, and OEC... Their brewery, I think, is super underrated uh, as far as the sour beers that they produce. But these, you know, Matthias and the team there has been bringing in beers uh, for a long time, based originally off of Michael Jackson's guidebooks, including like Shankarla uh, and others. And they made, they brought in some beers a while back that they stopped bringing in for a long time that have now come back. So St. George and Broy uh, from from Butenheim in in Franconia is an incredible brewer of unfiltered, unpasteurized Keller beer. Uh, I used to drink that in the late 90s, early 2000s. It disappeared. Yeah. Now it's back. And not only is it back, they're bringing it in in tank containers yeah. and kegging it stateside. Yep. And so when we get it, it's super fresh. The price is pretty good, and it's coming back. Now, they're not doing that because I've been selling those kinds of beers for the past 15 years, which I have been. They're doing that because there is a place in the market for it. It's back now. That's something crazy. Five years ago, if I said, do you think Keller beer from Franconia will be a big thing in 2018 <laughs> or a bigger thing? Nobody would say yes. No. So we don't know what's coming. We just need to stick with our guns. I think something that's great about having a lot of tap lines is that we can keep serving the beers that we've loved forever, welcome in the new styles we never even dreamed of existing, and showcase what's going on in beer yesterday, today, and tomorrow rather than maybe just what was going on in beer before or just today. And so I think that that's, kind of, that's been my mantra for a long time. And I think if you stick with that, you stay flexible, you're going to be okay. Do you have a hope for beer? Some of the stuff I just said, I think, is my hope for beer. Uh, my hope for beer is that people continue to do what they're doing right now around us with beer, which is come out, hang out with each other, drink as many beers as they want safely, and have a great, great time with each other and, and, and you know, and explore it. But my biggest hope is that, like when I first started drinking the Michael Jackson books, I'm sorry, drinking and reading those books, I would see that... Were, I mean, you put were, anything into a ninja blender and it'll just, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. But like, the thing is, like, when I would read those books, I would see that, like, he had, he was, he was finding beers from the way back and from the recent past and, and, and celebrating them alongside the new stuff that he was tasting then. I mean, I remember one of the first beers I ever served Michael Jackson at the Brick Scaler, because he used to yeah. go there every yeah, year. Yeah, I know. Was Stone he'd come into town and, yeah. yeah. He'd and he'd come stuff. in, he goes, I want some hops. So, like, think about that. In 2004, Michael Jackson was interested in the, I don't want to denigrate, but, or, or, you know, but like the hazy IPA pastry shot of that time. Yeah. That's what it was. He wanted to drink those. The aggressive, bitter, yeah, yeah. That West was, Coast, yeah. you know, yeah. He was smack always you in the open face for that. Yeah. yeah. He was always open for what's new as long as it can coexist and it should and can coexist with what's come before. And that's what, uh, that's my dream for beer. That's why we have. Here comes the plug. The Here Sovereign in Georgetown uh -huh. uh, serving true Lambic because spontaneous beer is great, but no spontaneous beer in the world comes anywhere close to what is being made in Brussels and in the Payotte land, even now. Of course. You know, and so th that's, you know, that's what I hope is that it all keeps growing. The amalgam keeps expanding, but, with not, but without like excising beers that have inspired the whole thing. Makes sense. Greg Engert from all of the various places, the neighborhood restaurant group, I guess we'll say, but from uh, Birch and Barley and Church Key and the Sovereign and uh, the nine other places. Uh, how many? How many all together? Well, we have. Uh, well, I, I, it's, I, I hate to qualify, but There's like, a lot. Well, yeah, it's 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 eighteen. Okay. Yeah, it's eighteen. Yeah, all but right. you know, a couple awesome coffee shops called Buzz and we have a great wine shop and stuff like that so yes alright so all of these various things but uh, all beverage director the, yeah. the, the beer guy yeah the beer guy uh, to, to distill it down into uh, you know the old vernacular as it were uh, thanks for sitting down thanks thank for, you John for sharing this uh, this uh, these beers with me and this uh, this conversation with our listeners 
If you have questions uh, that you'd like to hear addressed on this podcast, if you have uh, guests you'd like to hear or just general comments altogether, you can reach out to me directly. It's John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at beerandbrewing.com. You can join the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall. And you should go to beerandbrewing.com where you can subscribe to our magazine. Uh, both of the magazines, not only the consumer magazine, but if you're a brewing professional, you should sign up for our brewing industry guide, which comes out four times a year and covers the news and topics that you want to hear. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Greg, thanks again. My pleasure. And thanks so much for listening. Cheers. This episode has been brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, the country's only not-for-profit membership organization dedicated to promoting the community of homebrewers and empowering homebrewers to make the best beer in the world. Brew with the AHA at homebrewersassociation.org. And remember, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.